Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you like it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel, and that way you'll never miss a thing. Well, if you're like me, you're always looking for ways to stay informed and engaged with the world around us. And that's why I created On The Rise. It's a curated weekly newsletter packed with thought-provoking articles and insights on faith, culture, and the future of the church and really any other subject that I find fascinating and conversation worthy. And I send it to you absolutely free every single week. So if you're ready to join the conversation and be part of a community of curious, engaged leaders, you can subscribe to On The Rise today at ontherisenewsletter.com. You can start and stop at any point on theRiseNewsletter.com. This episode is also presented by Glue. Glue is connecting the faith ecosystem in innovative ways. One way is by making it a lot easier for churches to connect with new visitors. Did you know, for example, that the time it takes for a church to respond to new visitors has a major impact on whether that new person or family will stay? Well, with Glue, you can use automation to build engaging new visitor engagement journeys. You can learn how at get.glue.us slash visitors. That's get.glue.us slash visitors. And now to today's episode. Kevin, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah. Well, listen, I've been excited for this conversation for a while. I want to start with your eclectic tastes. I mean, You know, lots of things fascinate you, Kevin. Biology, photography, China, theology, the future, and so on. I'd love for you to complete the list. Uh, Maybe it would take the entire hour. I don't know. And um, talk a little bit about why a passion slash expertise in so many different fields. Um, I kind of signed up pretty early, um, with the idea that I was not going to have a career um, in my life. I, I, particularly when I dropped out of college, that was sort of a, a formative moment where I was kind of like saying, you know, I will probably be poor for most of my life. My, 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 um, my ideal, my dream is to build my own house and be self-reliant. And if I can do that somewhere and, you know, not have very much, but have a lot of time to, to make things, which is what I wanted to do, then I would be happy. And um, in that process of, as, uh, of not um, kind of following a career, I had permission to, to be curious about stuff and mm. follow what I wanted to because I wasn't really headed in any single direction that I knew about. And so... Um, so I took uh, the opportunity to pursue things that I was interested in um, as much as I could uh, without really consideration about whether that was going to be productive or profitable. And um, I think a lot of people would probably do likewise if they didn't have to, if they weren't really concerned about their career and livelihoods and things like that. And so it's not that I had money. My parents gave me no money. After I, I left high school, I was totally on my own. Um, but I just had resigned. Not that I was. I was just. I had the ability to do things without a lot of money. Hmm. I was kind of resourceful and thrifty, and um, controlled my time. And I found that controlling my time was more valuable than than having uh, a lot of money. And so I could, I could, you know, very rarely was not having enough money the true barrier to doing something. And what? What, what shaped anyway. that? So, so, no. so that allowed yeah, yeah. me to kind of uh, explore these things. What shaped that early on? I mean, the century. I imagine was there pressure from your parents to like find a career or or that kind of thing? There was no pressure. My parents actually were very, very supportive of my hmm. path. Um, they were the both the first in their entire families ever go to college. And <clears throat> so among their siblings, although my dad didn't have any siblings, my mom had lots of siblings. She was the only one who went to college. And so um, they kind of expected us to do that. And that's what sort of we were lined up in the high schools that we were going to, which were public high schools, but um, that was the expectation. And all my friends were headed in that you were going there. So that was sort of just the assumed path. And when I 
dropped out and said I didn't really want to go to begin with, that was a little concerning to them because at that time in 1970, there was, it made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Having a college degree was very much more important than it is today. And so, uh, and there wasn't even community college, really. There was, it was just kind of like one or the other. And so, um, there wasn't pressure, but there was a huge expectation. Mm. Uh, and, and, and here's the thing is, is the, 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 you know, when you, in high school, when they were counseling you, the, the pathways, if you didn't go to college, were I mean, they were very limited in terms of yeah. what you were expected to do. So, so it wasn't as if there were all these other options that you could imagine going. Um, there was no such things as startups or interns or even gap years for that matter. And so, um, so it was, so there was a, an expectation, um, that you would have a career and that you would work for a big, uh, company that would treat you well. And, and you know, the bigger the company, the kind of better they treated you. So, um, and there was more prestige. So, so the, 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 the expectations again was that you would work for a very fine, company, you know, 3M, GE, uh, the, you know, Pan Am Airlines, whatever it was, mm-hmm. something like that, and uh, or Kodak. Um, in our part of the woods, we were in uh, North Jersey, so there were a lot of bio, um, what we now call pharma companies, Merck, things like that. Bell Labs was there. So that was the expectation, and um, I was going a different way, and, and it was – pretty much an unknown um, path. And so I just expected it um, that, that I'd had per- permission to kind of, you know, become a beekeeper, which is what I did. You know, I, I raised bees and became really into bees and making the beehives and then pursuing whatever else I, I wanted to because I wasn't really trying to um, construct a career or a livelihood I was happy to get by and live very simply and learn stuff. Hmm. So, I mean, man, I feel like we could spend the hour on that, but uh, (laughs) that's a, that's, I think something a lot of younger adults are leaning to. It's like, we can leave, live simply. I can figure this out. But I think in the 1970s, that was a, a very unique path. And I'm maybe 15 years behind you in school. So I remember, you know, it was like college or the options were bleak. We didn't have the internet. It was just starting in the mid eighties. You say that your optimism keeps growing as you get older. Yeah. Can can you explain that? It's a deliberate choice. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there is a natural levels of optimism, you know, in, in personality. Some people are just tend to be more willing to um, think positively. Others have to try harder, but all of us can get better about it. And that's, and that, and that's sort of my point. And, and I have chosen to increase my skills of optimism because I found that it's very, very useful in um, getting things done and um, becoming comfortable with the, with the new things. Um, and so um I, I have increased my optimism deliberately, and I am, what's the word, encouraged by that, uh, by taking a longer view. So, so the longer, I think the longer the view you have of time, the, the easier it is to be optimistic. And so um, as I increase my, my view of both the past and the future, so I become increasingly interested in history and I, I and I also had the privilege of being uh, of being in a time machine, of traveling in a time machine into the past, which was uh, my my time in remote parts of Asia from the seventies. Um, so 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 I I had that long view of the past, of having some experience of living in medieval times, and then projecting into the future and and, and understanding that even fairly large horrors like the Ukraine war right now are only temporary. Mm -hmm. So these are temporary setbacks in this sort of ongoing accumulation of betterment. And um, the longer the view you have, the easier it is to overcome the setbacks that we have that are inevitable, the ups and downs. And, um, 
it's like long-term investing. You just, if you are a long-time investor, you can ignore, in a certain extent, those fairly major downturns because they're not going to they're not going to stay around for long. Hmm. So I've heard you reference it with Tim Ferriss in a conversation you did on his podcast, but can you explain the time machine? That's uh that's fascinating. Yeah, so so um I set out to Asia at almost the right exact moment for someone like me who had no money but a lot of time, which is um right at that moment in the early 70s um it became possible to journey into fairly remote places that in the recent past would have required like an expedition, a mm. bunch of money and um, support. But now with the advent of Jeeps and buses, you could buy a, a you know, a jeepney ticket without having to hire anybody. You could just buy up and you could get a ride in or then you could walk in with from the road into places that had not changed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And um, uh, so they had not yet been westernized. They, they maybe didn't have vil- electricity in, in hmm. the entire village. Um, there was very little metal being used and <laughs> and the and the the social family structures there would have been you know child brides there would have been um uh, so, you know indentured servants basically like slaves there would have been the entire medieval structure social structure there's no sewers there's no plumbing it's <laughs> it's like living in the past and that was um accessible to someone like me who didn't have any real money, but I could live there and explore for very cheap. And um, that didn't last long because once the buses or Jeeps came in, change started to come in very fast. Hmm. Um, Once you could import cotton T-shirts, you didn't make your own clothing anymore. So the costumes, your, your uniform kind of went away very fast. So, but right, but, but for a very short time, there was this moment where you could get in for very little finding lodging and stuff. Maybe you're staying at homestays and you had an an experience of living in this ancient world, which within a decade almost kind of began to disappear. And that's of course what my, my project of documenting this before it disappeared or as it was disappearing was was the big 50-year project that I did called Vanishing Asia, where mm. I was ex- trying to explore and get to these places and photograph them um, before they disappeared. Mm. Yeah, and you released a book on that a couple of years ago. Right, right? it's called Vanishing yeah. Asia. Wow. Well, books. It was three volumes, uh, 9,000 images, 1,000 pages. <laughs> it, was, it was way over the top. It was just crazy. What were your main observations? Like if you were going to talk about your wisdom, excellent advice for living, but when you think about what you saw in 19, early 70s and the way we were living in the West, what were some impressions that really guided you, stuck with you, surprised you? Well, the main, one of the main takeaways was these were beautiful places to visit. Mm-hmm. They were stunning in their architecture, their beauty, fantastic vistas, the heart, the kind of, you know, material harmony, I would call, you know, because most of the houses were made from the materials at hand. So there was hmm. a certain amount of appropriate look to them. Um, and the, there's a lot of variety and amazing differences. Um, so it was a fantastic, uh, places to visit, but it was very clear that, um, to me, the advantages of what modern life was like, because they were horrible places to actually have to live and grow up Mm. as, you know, compare again, compared to what we have right now, the houses look beautiful, but they were leaky, cold, damp, filled mosquitoes and smoke and Mm. no plumbing. So it was like, 
Uh, it's a great experience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But I'll take the I'll take the air conditioned uh, concrete box with Wi Fi and yeah. water. That's what you know, and that's what they all want. So they move into the city to 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 get that apartment. And so, um, yeah, and and also more not just the material world, but more importantly, the people there, no matter their talents or abilities had only one occupation, one thing they could do, which was farming, basically. And um, they didn't have a choice about that. They might could have been a musical genius. It could have been a mathematical genius. Hmm. And we would never get to appreciate that or, or, or benefit from, from that because they had only, they didn't have that choice. And so, so I came away with a huge, huge new appreciation of what technology does, what mm. it gives us, what civilization in the ongoing process of infrastructure, and how it subsidizes our dreams by um, making sure all of us are literate, by giving us literacy, by giving basic health care and longevity, by giving security and safety. These are all important things that were not present there. So there are many cool things that were in that time, but they're not enough. They're not offset by all the things that they lacked that we have. And most people, including me, will choose today's world over the past. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you went there and we talked about this because I think we have a view. I have a degree in history as well, not you know, a formal one, but not the experience that you have. We, it's easy to romanticize the past, but there is the argument that as despairing as we are of the present, we've never actually had it better. And I wonder if that long view, you said your, your optimism is fed by looking deep into the past and also taking the long view of the future. Did that feed into your optimism narrative to see how bleak it was in yeah, medieval yeah, times? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, one of the things that, that, that is very peculiar about today, even among progressives, with that word progress, is, is how, how much um, progress is not believed. Mm. It's, um, the, the scientific evidence, the, the historical evidence, every bit of evidence uh, points to the fact that progress has been real and that um, today is the best time for humans ever so mm. far. And so, um, so there is a romantic notion, as you say, uh, among people, particularly people who see themselves as smart is to think that, that we've, that we're running downhill from some imaginary high point mm. in the past. And usually when you ask people what that high point is, is it's whenever they were 10 years old and, and, and that was, that was the perfect world because, because they were 10 and they, and the world was new and they had no responsibilities. Of course it looked great. And so, um, uh, so, but it's not true. The, 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 if you look actually every metric that we really care about, um, this is the better time to be alive. You mentioned uh, boxes with Wi-Fi and heating and air conditioning. How did you get interested in technology? One of the things, you're known for many things, but one of them is uh, you were an editor, the chief editor at Wired Magazine for many, many years. Hugely influential tech journal. Yeah, I, so I was a hippie, uh -huh. basically, traveling with very little. And I, again, I was kind of resigned to the idea that I would never have very much. I had a bicycle and I had a camera. A sleeping bag, you know, a change of clothes. I, I just owned very, very little. And um, that was perfectly fine with me. And I had no interest in sort of technology as it was normally thought of then. Um, my dad actually worked with computers very early and I would, didn't really want, he was kind of always kind of, you know, look at this, this is kind of cool. It's like, mm, I'm just not interested. Punch um, card computing back then? Yeah. It was all mainframe computing okay. with punch cards. and. Yeah. Yeah, he took me to a uh, a computer fair in 1965. So the first computers mm. I saw were 1965, and I think he was maybe hoping to impress me. But man, I was like, no, these aren't computers. I know what computers are. 
you can talk to computers. These are just like cabinets. There's no screens. There was no, the, the output was like a, a typewriter machine, just typing things. I was like, what? And you talk to them by making uh, punch cards. It's like, that's, these aren't computers, really. Um, so I had no interest in that. And, um, uh, but I changed my mind or my mind was changed in, um, when I was working at the University of Georgia in a, in a science lab and they got an Apple IIe to do some data processing and I connected to the modem to do some typesetting for, um, a little catalog that I was running as my side hustle. And, uh, when I put the modem, when, when I added the telephone to that little dumb computer, which is computers aren't really that interesting by themselves, but when you add a telephone to them, they become communication devices. And that was like, oh my gosh, there's something happening in these bulletin boards. This is in the early eighties, like 1981 or so. It was like, <gasps> there's, 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 it was, it felt, magical it felt appropriate it felt so human scale and human like communicating at a distance with people in a whole new way it was it was really it was uh thrilling and so i started to try and research this for because i was i was doing travel writing it was the one thing i knew about at that time the one thing i had an ex- expertise in was travel so i decided to treat this as a new country the online world's new country. So I was doing like a tour guide hmm. to this new country, like as if it was a, uh, I was a travel writer. And um, that experience start, started to change my mind about technology. And once I saw that there was an organic biological side, I went to the first A-Life conference and that cemented the intellectual underpinnings for understanding that the difference between life and, and technology was very, very subtle and, really the kind of two faces of the same coin. And so that was the beginning of my shift uh, and seeing that actually technologies could be um, human scale and appropriate. They didn't have to be big monolithic steamrollers and factories and, you know, locomotives and that kind of stuff. They could be something that was closer to us and more fitting to us. And that, And with that, I began to rethink my attitude about technology in general. Hmm. So how did Wired come up? Well, I was running. So I was running, editing, and and publishing a magazine called The Whole Earth Catalog, The Whole Earth Review, Coevolution Quarterly. And it was was a magazine um, of intellectual, conceptual news, new ideas. And new tools. There's, there's mm-hmm. new tools and new ideas. And so I've, I've been a tool maker, a tool user, and, and the whole earth catalogs with access to tools. So we were giving people tools. And then later on, I did my own version of it, and I called, I called it um, a catalog of possibilities. So what tools were, were possibilities? And what the magazine was about was talking about new possibilities. And um, I was editing that, and I was drifting into uh, – I did a couple issues and a couple special projects that were – what we would now say were wired like I called it signal. So hmm. I did a, a whole catalog of signal stuff, which was all this new digital technology and the culture around it. And I did a, a magazine issue called signal and I was going to start a whole nother magazine called signal that was like wired, but it was a little bit different because a uh, whole earth was, was a nonprofit and we were, we were doing this very, very now thing, which a subscription only, no ads. <laughs> so we had a magazine that had no ads. It was completely reader generated. It was the readers sent in the material and then I would edit it and select it and curate it and send it back to the subscribers. It was beautiful, beautiful thing. It was very powerful. And the posts were, we recognize now as blog posts. They were basically blog posts. And, um, the problem was it was a very small set of people. So we had only 40,000 subscribers at the peak. We always said, well, it's the right 40,000 people, which was true. It's like the TED conference. It was the mm-hmm. TED people. And so that was happy. And then Lewis and Jane came along, whom I had reviewed uh, 
previous magazine they'd done, I was a fan of it. And they came out to California. Well, they, they wanted to do a bigger one. I said, well, you need to move out to California to do it. And they did. And then they were uh, looking for an editor. And I was saying, I already have a job. <laughs> you know, I already, I'm already doing this. But what they wanted to do was what I was doing, but at a bigger scale. They wanted to do it in color. And, and Lewis insisted, and rightly so, he says, look, this is, um, this is about, we're going to take these ideas that you were interested in, but we're going to wrap them around people. It's going to be a people. It's going to be people on the cover, faces. We're going to make the heroes out of the nerds. And um, it'll be about their stories. It was like the people who are making this, what are their dreams? And so that shift to just talking about the ideas to wrapping around people was what Wired was about. It was about the culture of technology and tools rather than the tools themselves. And that was genius and the right Mm. thing. And they were willing to do the business side of it, which I had no interest in doing so they could raise the money. And so um, it was an opportunity to kind of continue my exploration of new ideas and concepts, but in the wrapping of people and their dreams. And we were lucky because this came at the exact right moment when the internet, which had been around for decades, burst into the scene because of the graphical user interface of the web. So, So we were there at the birth of the web we were involved in making up, you know, the web, inventing the web uh, publications. And so I was lucky that, that all this kind of came together at the very right time. Yeah, speaking of the birth of the internet, probably another thing that you're best known for is your Thousand True Fans mm-hmm. uh, blog post that I think is pushing 15 years old now. Is that right? Yeah. About that. Can you, and this is, I mean, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing today is in part uh, thanks to the inspiration of sure. a thousand true fans. And it gives people like me, this is the basement of my house, the opportunity to reach millions of people a year right. and to actually live indoors and feed my family sure. off of it, which is incredible. Can you explain, we have a lot of young leaders listening, a lot of wannapreneurs listening, you know, people who would love to do something significant out on their own. The idea, the genesis behind the thousand true fans, like the the nut of the idea, and then any way you might update that for where we are in the 2020s at this point. So um, maybe the shortest version of the thousand true fans idea was... um, to start with what the existing scheme was, if you were a creator, someone who makes stuff, and that's what this is really pertaining to, um, then for a long time, you worked with a publisher, if, if you were an author, or you worked with a, a label, if you were a musician, or you worked with a studio, if you were a, you know, a cinematographer. You, you worked with some kind of corporation that could maybe bankroll you and then distribute, either manufacture and then distribute this stuff widely. And for that, they, and for that, they took a very large percent um, of whatever was being sold, the, the product of your work. And in order to then have any success, you needed very large numbers. You needed to have a bestseller. You needed to go platinum mm-hmm. with a record. Um, and so, which might be millions and that was sort of the path to success. Um, but I realized that this new technology that we were inventing with email and then later on social media allowed, um, an, an artist, a creator to contact his or her fans directly and if you could get your truest fans, the people who were completely nuts about whatever it was that you were doing and would go all the way in and buy everything that you made for that year, if you could get them to give you the money directly, bypassing the studios and labels and book publishers, then you didn't need to have a million people, a million, a million fans. You could, you could mathematically have a thousand true fans giving you a hundred dollars a year and then you'd have hundred ten you'd have a hundred thousand dollars a year to work with. And of course, if it was less than a hundred dollars, you know, maybe it's eighty thousand dollars a year. 
Or if it's a two of you, you, you need twice as many. So that was the theory. And at the time, it was just a theory. I'm saying this is what it should work out, even though there was no examples of anybody doing it at that time because the technology was new. And um, this was before Kickstarter and Patreon. But as these tools came up, it was now possible to actually do what my suggestion was. And of course, since then, hundreds of thousands of people have, have, have done this and it does, it does work. It, it does work. And so what we've learned since then is that um, it does work, but it takes a lot of effort on the part of the creator to engage with the fans. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's almost like another full time job, yeah. If you're really doing it well, if you really are so living off of that, and um, and there are creators who may not be suited to that. They would much rather paint all day, or sculpt, or for they don't want to have to deal with fans. And that's too too. This is not. I'm not saying that everybody going this going in this direction. It's just that this is an option. And by the way, if you're starting out. It's a fabulous way to start out. A lot of people start out that way and then they have some success. And then later on, they decide, hey, I don't want to keep doing this. I will work with a publisher or a label or a studio um, and I'll increase my reach and I'll give up that because um, I understand, you know, how valuable that is and I just don't want to do it anymore. So, um, so that's where it is. It's, it's, um, there's a lot of skills in, in engaging with fans and true fans, um, but there's a lot of payoff. And one of those benefits is that true fans are some of your best marketers. They market it to the casual fans. So you have concentric circles. It's not just the true fans income. You can actually have casual fans that are actually being sold to by the true fans. And so, um, so it's a really great way to to start and the thing about a thousand is that it's achievable if you just do if you just gain one true fan a day in a couple of years you can have your thousand true fans and the other final reason why it's a good model is that um we now have kind of a global economy and we global reach with um with these tools of the internet and social media, and increasingly we'll have um, language translations so that we can actually communicate in real time with people despite what their lack of English or uh, need for English. And I think um, what that means is that when you have a billion possible candidates in the world, the, even the weirdest, most esoteric niche idea that you have that appeals to only one in a million people, you can still find a thousand of them out of the billions Mm. of people on the planet. So there will be a thousand possible true fans for your craziest, weirdest idea. And the challenge right now is finding them, making that match. That is not easy, but it does say that you have the potential to have a thousand true fans, no matter what it is that you're doing. Has it gotten harder in the 2020s to get those thousand true fans? I mean, I started blogging in 2012 for real. And it was one of those things where I wrote before work because I had another day Uh job as a lead pastor. And it's not an exaggeration to say the way social sharing happened. Sometimes articles would reach 10,000 people by the time I broke for lunch. Like it was crazy. And this podcast too, we started in 2014 hit number one in the charts in our categories, number 40 overall in iTunes back in the day. And I've launched other shows and helped other people launch other shows. And it just seems like it's a little harder to get out of the gate today. Or would you nuance that in any way? Um, yeah, it's it, uh, the, the own, you know, our, our, our attention is our only scarcity, our time and attention. And we have so many options for that. So, so, in that sense, yes, it is harder. It is harder to get someone to maintain their attention for you. I think it's easier to actually find things than ever before, but to maintain that attention is harder because basically we've raised the the bar. We've raised expectations. 
you know, to, 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 to subscribe to a newsletter today, it's got to be really good because there are so many other ones that might be even better. And so, um, you know, um, so, so there is, so, so finding it, I think is easier, but maintaining that attention is harder oh. and makes, it makes you have to go even further in distinguishing yourself because you're likely not the only one in your category anymore. And that is the problem. And so the problem is, is not the problem, but the challenge to, to go back to my book, The Excellent Advice for Living, is mm-hmm. don't be the best. Don't aim to be the best. Aim to be the only. Mm. So, so what that means is like you want to be in the category of one. You don't want because, – because then you, there's not competition. You can – you want to be able to do something. It's easier to kind of be the best in that category if there's a category of one. And so um, that I think that is driving people to the realization that, that they need to become more distinguished, more, more separate, more different, more only, um, in order to um, – up the, the the quality and the, and the and the uh with the, and the maintenance and the continuity of of the attention that people have um you it's sort of like you have to be better the the, the level of quality has just increased all around i mean like the quality of podcasts today is just they're astounding mm-hmm. think about the mm-hmm. best ones it's like it's amazing how much and in you know it's those that, you know, rattle off just a quick interview with their friends, it's not going to be sustainable in the long term. Yeah, sustainability is a really, really important factor too in doing this full time now. It's amazing how much work it actually is right. to, to do a good job. All right. I wanted to talk about AI. I'm going to put a pin in that. Um, and I want to get to your book, Excellent Advice for Living, Wish Wisdom I Wish I Had Known Earlier. Fantastic right. book, Kevin. And I first encountered it, I think, in blog form. Was was it your 68th birthday is the first time you correct. tried that? Yeah. And I remember reading it going, wow. Like the whole thing. Of, so this is a book of, I don't know whether you'd call them, uh, I, I think of them as modern proverbs, aphorisms. Yep. Um, basically, it's just pithy sayings that are packed with wisdom. Um, <clears throat> like for example, everything I've, 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 I had a list of 25 from the book and then I've cut it down. So what I'd like to do is play a little game sure. where I state one and then you just comment on it and then we can move to the sure. next or if there's some that we miss. Are you good with that? Great. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's great. I'm going to buy a whole bunch and and gift this book to people I care about. So here's one of them. You can't reason someone out of an argument they didn't reason themselves into. Yeah, we don't. (laughs) Most people's beliefs, including most of my own, are things that I inherited or given or absorbed, not through any kind of logic, but just because it was the environment. You know, I mean, I I have lots of notions that I have no personal experience of, you know, that I would pretty strongly hold on to. And it wasn't because uh, that I reasoned myself into them. It was just because that's sort of what the accepted wisdom is. And so you can't undo that by trying to argue. You have to, um, you actually have to listen. Listening is the best way to try to change someone's mind. Active listening. Well, my time in law school has had me make a lot of uh, wasted hours trying to talk people out of things they didn't reason themselves into. So I'm going to hang on to that one. Uh, We've already talked about this one, but if there's more, please say so. Don't be the best, be the only. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think everybody born and yet unborn has, like, we have a unique face because we have a unique set of genes and those genes also help us produce different talents, different geniuses, different abilities and gifts. And then we have different life experiences, and those all combined to mean that every person is potentially able to share a genius that has never been shared before. And um, 
to do that, they have to be equipped to do that. And that equipment, equipment includes, you know, getting literate, going to school, having basic health care and good hygiene and all the other elements that we need in addition to be able to have the right tools. And so part of what technology gives us is these new tools to allow like the genius of Mozart to make a symphony with the piano or cinema for Lucas and Hitchcock, you name it, we're, we're doing it. And so there are people yet, there are people born today who are waiting for us to make the next really cool tool that they could really shine. But nonetheless, we're all trying to find what that is. And it's not, a, not evident when you're young is not at all clear for most people like myself, especially what it was that we're better at than others. And so this is kind of like a lifelong journey in many ways. Um, and you kind of never really arrive. And having talked to a lot of remarkable, accomplished people who are famous, it's clear that even they are still asking themselves, what do I do when I grow up? Mm -hmm. And having mm -hmm. fame and having a billion dollars does not answer that question. Yeah. Okay. And so it's not a destination that we ever arrive at until the day before we die, but it's, a, a, a direction. And so you want to set out in that direction of trying to uncover, develop, grow into the thing where you are doing something that you find easy to do and others find hard, that you um, are really good at and others don't even understand. Um, because that's much more likely. And then when you are, as you get close to that and you're, you're able to, to do things, so you're It'll because it's your natural talents. You'll, it'll be something that you love doing. It'll be things that you're good at because you're the only. You have a much greater likelihood of getting paid for it, and you won't have a lot of competition. That's why it's kind of easy. So, so it's a great place to to be. But it's hard. It's really hard because we have these images of success for others. You know, the number one golf player, the number one mm. school teacher, they're, 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 they're already occupied, first of all. <laughs> Someone's already there. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's very unlikely that, that your set of talents are going to be exactly perfect for that. And mm -hmm. so don't aim for that. So, so what you're kind of trying to do in some ways is invent a brand new way, a brand new definition of success. Wow. For yourself. And it probably won't include a billion dollars. All right. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like you don't need that for your success. That's fine. Yeah. Well, this job didn't exist a decade ago. Exactly. I think we share a, a Christian faith. Right. Um, Kevin. And one of the early patriarchs, matriarchs, Irenaeus, said, and I thought about this. It was seen as heresy, I think, at the time or by in some circles, but I really think there's something to it. The glory of God is man fully alive right. or woman fully alive. When you see an artist on stage, I was at a John Mayer concert. When you see him really play the guitar, you're like, oh my goodness. And I love how you, you, you stamped it with our genetics, et cetera. Like, you know, I look back on my life and from the time I was a kid, I was a communicator. Now I had no idea. There's no job, right. you know, you're a communicator. But if you look at the thread in law, in preaching, in what I'm doing now, it, I'm a communicator. Sure. That's what I am. And when I do that well, I come alive. Right. When when I start to get into the weeds in a company, or and then, then it goes horribly wrong quickly. But is that similar? Like, don't be the best, be the only, and look to what what you said, what is easy for you that is difficult or impossible exactly. for Exactly. I, I also mm -hmm. have another bit of advice in the book. Like, if you can, at all possible work, somewhere where there's no name for what it is that you're doing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like where it takes yeah. half an hour to explain to your mom what it is that you're up to. That's a really great sign. And if 15 that's years every ago, cocktail party said, I go well, to. it's kind of like radio, but it's not quite radio. It's like a, yeah. it's like a magazine interview, but it's not that either. It's on audible. It's like what we now say it was podcasting, but now it's, everybody knows what it was, but 15 years ago, right. you'd have to really kind of explain things. And um, you were mentioning science <laughs> communicator. I have, oh, uh, communicators. I have two friends 
who are science communicators. That's that's hmm. their that's how what they call themselves. That was not even a thing <laughs> fifteen years ago. Whatever it is, it's now a thing. Uh-huh. Um, like like you, they weren't quite scientists, but they were really good at talking about it and. That talking about it was was valuable even to the scientists themselves. So they kind of they have a part in this ecosystem, and um, it's it's a it's a thing. It's they can get better at it and they can get more like it. And so they're now um, you know mathematician mathematics science communicators. Okay, wow. and and so um, yeah, that's it's really great that you are kind of on that journey and getting closer to what it is that you're the only about. Um, and I suspect that there is even further that you can go in kind of becoming something where you're a category of one. I will pursue that with interest. And then you get super practical. So I read this, I think this was in your original blog post, and it solved a problem for me with our front porch. We didn't build this house, we bought it. (laughs) A balcony or porch needs to be at least six feet deep, otherwise you won't use it. I got a tape measure when I read that, and I'm like, that's why this front porch doesn't work. (laughs) And then we built a back porch, much bigger, and it works. That's a fascinating rule. Just not a long excursus on that, but tell me about that. It has to be six feet deep or you won't use it. So that came from... It was also verified by my experience, but the, the notion was first, I was the first alerted to it by Christopher Alexander, who wrote a book called Pattern Language, which mm-hmm. I highly recommend to anybody thinking about altering or building their own space, whether it's a house, an office, whatever it is. Because he went around the world and he observed these patterns, they, he called them patterns, in all kinds of things. And one of those patterns was about balconies. But there are other patterns that are also almost as useful that um, are kind of buried in this book of patterns. Things Hmm. like um, you want to think about um, pools of light. When you're you're thinking about lighting your rooms, artificial lighting, you know, lights, um, you want to think about pools of light. The lights should pool rather than just kind of be um, visible, not necessarily um, seeing the source indirectly. So anyway, this was sort of like a heuristic. It's like, think in terms of pools of light. And so um, that's harder to explain, which is why I didn't include it. But there are other <laughs> patterns, there are other patterns in the, the, the book that I'd recommend. And it's Christopher who? Christopher Alexander. Okay, we'll link to it in the show yes. notes. Yes, and um, I, someone just sent me a link. Someone had taken the book and made a, a web interactive version of it. Um, That'd be cool. The book is kind of expensive, but you can find news copies. Um, well, anyway, maybe we can get that if it's available publicly. We'll link to that as well. You know, another another one that's eminently practical, and I laughed out loud when I read it. Uh, I think this is in the book alone. The enjoyment of your travel is inversely proportional to the size of your luggage. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's so true. It's so true. If you want a really great adventure. Sometime try traveling with just a day pack. Mm. A day pack meaning that it's something you carry with you the entire time. Ah, it's on your back. It's on your back. On your arm. Mm-hmm. On your back. On your arm. It's it's. There's a little bit of a challenge to it, but man is really liberating, and it's liberating particularly if you're kind of doing a kind of travel which is harder to do these days, but possible, which is you don't have things booked in advance. We need to have a term for that. I'm not really sure what that term is. Kind of, um, I wouldn't call it naked travel, but there is a sense in which you are. (laughs) um, Because it's so easy to book ahead, everybody Mm -hmm. books ahead, which makes it hard not to book ahead. Yeah. Okay. And so, but if you don't, and you have that flexibility of just carrying, it's, it's, you can kind of skip through, skip through a place in a way that you can't do it when you have to have reservations and you've got luggage and blah, blah, blah. With this, you can just hop on a bus. It's easy to you take public transportation. You go somewhere, you go to a hotel, you have a room. No, okay, I'll just walk down the street to the next one. And um, it's really, really great. Anyway, that's an extreme form. I'm not suggesting that. Wow. I'm saying just once in your life, try it. Um, but generally, 
the, the travel to leave things behind. So you want to leave as much behind as possible. Well, I'll tell you, my wife and I have been having this conversation when I read your book. We've got a month trip around the world, basically. Uh, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Germany, and then home. And the challenge is to do it on a carry-on each. Yeah, you but, can. Uh, I think, oh yeah, I've, I've done a month before in Europe. And uh, challenge accepted. Okay, we're coming up on time. There's so much more in this book, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the last one this. The chief prevention, because your catalyst for doing this was your 70th yeah. birthday right? Mm -hmm. The chief prevention against getting old is to remain astonished. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, there's a great, um, CK Lewis comedian routine about the fact that Hmm. we go on these airplanes. So you have these steel tubes in the sky traveling, you know, at the speed of sound across and, and people are grumbling about peanuts you know, they didn't get, they missed their peanuts, whatever it was. And we're just mm-hmm. not astonished by what is actually happening in the, in the tools and opportunities that we have. That's just one level, but also to ma- remain astonished at new things, things we didn't know. I have a bit of advice that um, try to become curious about things you're not interested in. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I do, mm-hmm. I do a lot, until COVID, a lot of my livelihood was giving talks about technology around the world. And there was a tip I heard from Alvin Toffler, which I really loved, is when he was doing the same thing, he would always duck into the adjacent ballroom where there was an entirely different conference happening, usually on something he knew nothing about. Of course, yeah. And you attend that and you learn so much. It's like it's like picking a book at the library out of random, and you just like you get into it. And so, um, so there. Are, so I do that with YouTube. YouTube is my mm-hmm. version of that, of heading into these little subcultures on YouTube that I know nothing about. Makeup videos. I have really no interest in it whatsoever, but I'm curious about it, and it will just tell you so much. I am astonished in that way. So that's, you know, what I would suggest to stay young is dip into some YouTube subcultures and be ready to be astonished. Well, Kevin, I'll tell you, I had very high hopes for this first conversation and you greatly exceeded them or this conversation did. And we got to, we missed more questions than we got to. But I want to thank you for your generosity of time. The book is called Excellent Advice for Living. It's available anywhere you can get a book. And you're still blogging and writing online, which I thank you for. So well, where I, can people find yeah, you on the internet? I, I appreciate it. I haven't been writing as much as I would like to these days. I'm doing more art than I have. I, I post a piece of art every day for have for several years. Currently, it's kind of AI co-generated art. Um and I continue to make things um, as well as other books. Um, but I really appreciate this chance to chat with you um, about excellent advice for living. And, and one of the things I just heard recently was um, a lot of parents are saying, you know, my, my kids just don't listen to my advice at all, but they'll listen to someone else. So I hand them your book because <laughs> it's a way for them to listen to some advice because they don't listen to me. I thought, yeah, that's, that's, I think that works. That's, that's what it's for. <laughs> Kevin, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Thank you for publishing it. Thank you for all that you do. And I hope this is a round one. I'd love to do a round two at some time. Thank you so much. Well, great. I um, wish you the best on your adventure as well. <laughs>